our second session today. Uh, the first uh, speaker is uh, Spencer Klein. Uh, Spencer, could you share your screen? How does that look? Uh, uh, yeah, it's perfect. Uh, okay. Uh, so the first speaker is Person uh, Crane from uh, Star Collaboration. Uh, if you um, are ready, uh, the screen is yours. Oh, thank you. And I'd like to thank the organizers for this invitation. I'm gonna talk about work on using coherent dipion photo production to image gold nuclei. This is um, for the work for the Star Collaboration. And I wanna particularly acknowledge Yaping Zhi, who is my co-author on did, and who did most of the work. Um, I'll talk a little bit about nuclear shadowing and D sigma DT and the shape of the nucleus. I think most of you are familiar with that. Briefly mention the star detector and then talk about the analysis how we extract and fit D sigma coherent DT. And I'll spend a fair bit of time talking about concerns, limitations, and systematic uncertainties. These are, many of them are very general, certainly for all UPCs, and some of them are very relevant for the electron ion collider. So um, as I think most of you know, um, the way we can study nuclear um, shadowing is to probe the nucleus with a dipole photon fluctuates to a quark anti-quark pair, which then scatters elastically from the nucleus and emerges in this analysis as a rho or direct pi plus pi minus or an omega. Um, this of course is too low in Q squared to really expect that perturbative QCD would be applicable, but it is still interesting in a way to probe shadowing. Um, it's useful to think about um, two different extremes here. One extreme is if you have a very large dipole, you can leave this as a dipion, very small dipion mass, it will then come in and interact and basically smash into the nucleus and interact on the front face. And in this case, the nucleus will look like a black disc. On the other hand, you can have a small dipole. This generally corresponds to high dipion masses, which will penetrate more deeply and see the internal nucleons in the limit of the very small dipole, you recover a wood saxon distribution. So essentially, shadowing changes the effective shape of the nucleus, and we can see this by looking at d sigma dt for coherent photoproduction. Um, this is a kind of a key measurement at the EIC. It was highlighted in the 2012 white paper and the 2021 yellow report. Um, and you saw this plot on the left, actually both plots are from the white paper, shows D sigma DT coherent. You can see these diffractive minima. You can then Fourier transform and get this F of B, which is essentially the transverse profile of the interaction sites in the nucleus. Um, Star has looked at this in the past. This is a paper from a paper that was published in 2017 use 294,000 photo produced dipion pairs after tight cuts. And again, you know, it was well fit by, the mass spectrum was well fit by the rho plus direct pions plus omega to pi plus pi minus. The latter was really only visible via interference. Um, they measured D sigma D coherent DT as shown in the left plot. And you can see the diffractive minima. These are for XN, XN and one and one and excitations. Um, essentially, you can think of these two almost independent data sets. Um, and then they Fourier transform to get the F of B shown at the right. A um, couple of things you can see here, the, the red and the blue are for the two different data sets. You can see they agree quite well on the sides or the shoulders of the nucleus. There's a disagreement at very low, low B. Um, this is because basically star could not go up to high enough T um, and essentially you get a problem that's known in signal processing as windowing. If you have uncertainties here, then you have uncertainty. If you have uncertainty, low T corresponds to small B, you get this uncertainties. This blue band here shows what you get by varying the range of T max, i.e. the maximum T you consider in the Fourier transform. And then of course at large T, you can see there's this negative range here 
This is due to the destructive interference between the two possible photon exchange directions. So um, what I'm gonna do today is look at trying to do a quantitative fit to look at these two, see where we are between these two limits. There's the small dipole, again, interactions follow the Wood-Saxon distribution. Um, we use a six and a half Fermi um, radius for protons, add a quarter of a Fermi for a neutron skin, and this D here of 0.7, represents the skin thickness. Um, the counter model, the other model is this large dipole, you can think of it as a black disc. Um, this is, um, in, you know, an interesting, there's an interesting problem here, you know, with the wood sacks and you can fit things to the density distribution. For a black disc, it is unclear what you should choose for the maximum radius. There's just no clear definition here for most of what I'll show you we're going to take the black disc radius to be eight Fermi which is kind of the largest reasonable value and of course in both cases there's this normal normalization set by requiring that there be 197 nucleons um so to go from these the sigma dt or to these new density profiles or alternately in the other direction so if you have coherent photo production the cross section is basically the square of the sum of the amplitudes, A sub I, and then there's a phase factor, E to the I PX. Um, and so you can clearly see you get coherence for you know, P less than X sub I, or more precisely, PT less than the nuclear radius. Um, we're gonna neglect the longitudinal momentum here, it's small. Um, and then you, with that, you can uh, more, Mathematically sophisticated, right? Is this f of b goes as the Fourier transform of the square root of the sigma dt. It's the square root because you're transforming the amplitude, not the cross section. There's this ambiguity of which is the correct sign to use the sigma dt. Um, to handle that, you flip the sign of the sigma dt after going through each diffractive minimum. It's a 2D Fourier transform. So there's a Bessel function here. As I've mentioned here is an issue go, you would like to go from zero to infinity, but there's an upper limit to T for PT, you can't go to infinity. That gives you this windowing problem I mentioned earlier. So now I'm talking about data, talk about data from, talk about today is from the solenoidal tractor at RIC. The main components are the time projection chamber for reconstructing charge tracks and the zero degree calorimeters, which are required in the trigger. So on um, the analysis, we're going to use star de gold, gold data from 2010 and 2011 with the UPC trigger that requires two to six tracks in the TPC and neutrons in both zero degree calorimeters. Um, the neutrons come from mutual Col Coulomb dissociation. Essentially, instead of being single photon exchange, there are three photon exchanged, one to produce the rho or the other dipions and then one each to excite both nuclei. Um, we select clean dipion events using tight cuts, subtract the background, which we use as a proxy like sign events. Then we'll fit this d sigma dt at high t to a dipole form factor to get the incoherent contribution to the cross section. We'll extrapolate that to small t and then subtract, leaving the coherent cross section. And then we'll fit this coherent cross section to a linear combination of two cocktails that represent the wood saxon and the black disc extremes using these two distributions I showed you earlier. Each cocktail has three components. One is the photon PT, the second is the Pomeron PT, um, and then we're getting this larger nuclear radius which is the neutron spell, shell, and then the third component is the experimental resolution. Um, this just shows you the dipion mass spectrum in blue and like sign pairs in red. Um, you can see it's a nice fit to what you expect. And we basically aim to have a 10 to 1 signal to noise ratio. We put a minimum mass cut of 0.62 GeV to avoid contamination from omega to 3 pions. Of course, we wouldn't see the pi zero then, and a maximum cut of 1.1 GeV. And that's because the signal to noise ratio drops at very high masses. Um, we fit the incoherent um, cross section to a form factor, dipole form factor shown here. Um, 
And this is the same thing that was done in the 2017 star paper. They found Q0 squared is 0 0.099 GV squared. We will choose a slightly different fit range, 0.05 to 0.45 GV squared. This is a wider range than in the star paper. Um, and this was done to minimize the statistical uncertainty and the distance for extrapolation downward in T. Um, we get a Q0 that's very similar to the star paper. The chi-squared per degree of freedom is 160 over 158. That's good. One important thing I'd like to point out is you could also fit, imagine fitting this to an exponential, as has often been done in the past. That does not work well. Um, you can see here an ex, on this plot, an exponential will be a straight line, and it's not. And this red line shows our actual fit. Um, one thing I want to point out is that this procedure has a bit of a problem and that you expect this dipole form factor to fail as T approaches zero. The reason is that most of the reactions you would look at for incoherent photoproduction have energy thresholds. For example, to emit a neutron, which is one of the major ways to have incoherent production, has a threshold energy of about 8 MeV. If you assume that it comes from a single nucleon that's recoiling, which is somewhat implicit in this dipole form factor that corresponds to a PT of 122 MeV over C. Below at lower energies and with that caveat lower PT, um, that channel shuts down. You would expect to see that reflected in some change in the cross-section in cross the sigma incoherent TT. There's also a threshold of 77 keV for photon emission. That's the lowest excited level of gold. And essentially in this region here, you probably need a more sophisticated approach that accounts for nuclear shell levels, but we don't have that yet. So using the dipole, taking note of these problems. Um, so this plot shows this, the coherent d sigma dt after the subtraction. You can see there's this first dip here, second dip here, Potentially, there's over subtraction for the second dip. It's maybe because it's sensitive to range used for the incoherent fit or potentially failure of the dipole approximation. So, as I said, we'll fit the sigma dt to the linear combination of the Wood Saxon and Black Disks approach, just this formula shown here with these three components. And we assume that the transverse directions of all three components are uncorrelated. So, we'll do an at, uh, well, numerical convolution of them with random relative directions. Um, Pomeron T spectra shown here, this is basically the nuclear form factor. For the Wood Saxon, this is a convolution of a uniform sphere plus the Yukawa potential shown here. For the black disk, it's just shown here. Um, there's a couple of interesting things that pop up here. Even if you use the same radii. Wait, three here, minutes left. Oh, no. Okay. Um, you can see that these zeros are not even, well, the zeros do not line up and they're not evenly spaced. Um, photon PT, similar thing. There's an issue that the standard formula shown here assumes you're integrating over all B. We require B greater than 2RA. B and PT and B are conjugate variables. So if you restrict B, the mean PT should increase. Um, spent a lot of time working on that. Do not have a solution that seems to work well. Um, this just shows the templates, um, the three components. Point out resolution is not particularly important here. Um, we also do not consider the templates interference between the two directions. So we cut out events with very small t to avoid that problem. Um, this shows the templates. Um, and here shows the fit results. And you can immediate thing you note is this fit is terrible. Chi squared per degree of freedom is 24, almost 25,000 for 28 degrees of freedom. It's terrible. Um, if you want to believe it, you get about 70% wood Saxon. Problem, of course, is that the fit would prefer a much larger nuclear radius, um, nine and a half to 10 Fermi. There's no clear um, solution here. Um, the radius mismatch dominates the fit. You know, here's where you have all the statistics and here you have all the large, you know, that's where you get all the contribution of the chi-squared. Um, so 
question is what's going on here? Bunch of problems. I've mentioned there's this problem, the incoherent subtraction and the dipole form factor is problematic at small t, um, limited t range. The problem with the photon PT spectrum is not quite right. Um, there's the limited B range. There's also an issue that the photon field is eight planar. It's stronger on the near side of the nucleus and the far side of the nucleus. You can also wonder the black disk and the wood saxing distributions do not match very well. It might be possible to match this in a dipole calculation that didn't just look at these two extremes though. So um, many of these problems are also true at the EIC. Um, the photon flux should be simpler at the EIC. Um, there you would use a different strategy. You can separate coherent and incoherent production by observing the products of nuclear breakup. Um, you know, but you still have to confront this problem. The sigma incoherent ET is probably not smooth as T approaches zero. Um, you need very good separation. This requires the ability to observe the photons from nuclear de excitation, their MEV range in the target frame typically and below. The gold is a 77 keV photon. Um, so you're talking about photons below 100 MEV in the lab frame. Um, you, there you could try this direct Fourier transform. You also need good resolutions for the vector meson and the scattered electron. So with that, I will stop here and I'm happy to take questions. Um, okay, thank you very much for this uh, very interesting talk. Uh, now we have time for questions or comments. Do we have any questions? Maybe maybe this is Daniel. So if I can make a, a comment, is there um, some um, additional information that can be used for making this uh, extracting the Fourier transform, like some some kind of limits on um, on the size of the of the tar of, of the transfer profile, you know, that can can help on the on, on making the Fourier transform. Um, so some some physical constraints, let's say from right. I, I I understand the question. The answer is less clear. Um, I think the I would tend to think the answer. I mean, if you just do the simple Fourier transform, you know, it goes from zero to infinity. But you're right. You know, there might be something you can do requiring that you know density to be zero above some limit. Um, in some sense, though what I was trying to do that with this linear fit, you know, to eliminate many of the degrees of freedom and just reduce it to a one dimensional problem. And that didn't work out so well, as you can see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Uh, I don't see any questions, uh, any more questions. Uh, okay. okay. Uh, Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Spencer. Uh, now we can continue with the next talk. Uh, the next speaker is Gianni. Gianni, yes. uh, uh, could you please uh, share your screen? Yeah. You should see my slides now at my mouse. Yes, yes, I can see. Good. Very nice. Uh, if you are ready, you can start. Yeah. So hi, everyone. So I'm going to talk about these higher order corrections to exclusive heavy vector meson production. And this work has been done in collaboration with Tom Slappi and Heikki Mantasari. So we are looking at exclusive vector meson production in deep inelastic scattering. So in the dipole picture, we can describe the pose like this so that we have a virtual photon, which fluctuates into a quark on the quark dipole. The dipole then interacts with the nucleus and after the interaction, the dipole forms the vector meson. Uh, at higher orders, we also get Feynman diagrams like this. So here the quark emits a gluon, and then this quark gluon anti-quark system interacts with the nucleus. So these Feynman diagrams uh, are described in the production amplitude by these first and second rows. 
So here we need the photon wave function, uh, the dipole target scattering amplitude n, and the meson wave function. And here we are working in this mixed space of coordinates. So in the transverse plane, we have this uh, transverse position coordinates x. And for the longitudinal, longitudinal direction, we have this uh, momentum fraction z. And this process is interesting because this dipole amplitude depends on the gluon structure of the nucleus. So this uh, provides us a probe of the nuclear structure. So to calculate this, we need these wave functions and the dipole amplitude. Uh, the virtual photon, photon wave functions we can calculate using a perturbative QCD. For this dipole amplitude, we have uh, energy uh, evolution equations describing its energy dependence. And then these evolution equations also need an initial condition that is usually taken from a fit to Hera data. And finally, we need this vector meson wave function, which is unfortunately non-perturbative. So what we can do for the vector meson wave function is use the fact that we are considering heavy vector mesons. So the quark and the anti-quark have small velocities. So this means that we can write things in terms of uh, as a power series in terms of this alpha s and the heavy quarks velocity v. And to do this, we use this non-relativistic expansion that Miguel talked about on Tuesday. So if you want uh, the wave function for the Fox state n, you can write it in terms of this leading order wave function for Fox state m. So in terms of Feynman diagrams, uh, this blue blob here describes the leading order wave function. And then we add this Feynman diagram corrections to it, we get the total wave function. And here in this expansion, the alpha s corrections are included in this coefficient c. And uh, these relativistic corrections are included in this sum as these k terms. So this k describes the power of the velocity v. And in this talk, I will uh, consider two types of higher order corrections. So first, I will talk about uh, relativistic corrections at the order v squared and leading order in alpha s. So uh, these wave functions do not have any dependence on the alpha s. And then I will talk about uh, the next leading order corrections in alpha s in the non-relativistic limit. And then we take only the first term in this sum here. And these coefficients c are, are calculated at the order, uh, at the next leading order. And this simplifies the system considerably as now we only need to know this uh, leading order wave function for Fox state q, q bar. And this is, of course, still non perturbative. So uh, we need to figure out this non perturbative constants that depend on the leading order wave function. And what we do is that we make an ansatz for the wave function in the rest frame. So we basically do a Taylor, Taylor expansion in terms of this uh, position R and keep only the first two terms. And then the first term is the fully non-relativistic contribution, whereas the second term uh, corresponds to these relativistic corrections at the order V squared. So now we have uh, two unknown constants. The, value of the wave function at the origin and its derivative. And now we'll, I will talk about uh, JSI production because for JSI, we can determine these constants using NRQCD matrix elements. And these NRQCD matrix elements in turn have been determined from Charmonium DK bits. So now we have our wave function in the rest frame, but what we need is the light front wave function. So there are there are a couple of differences between the two. So first of all, the rest frame wave function is described in fully position space, whereas for the light front wave function, we use this mixed space of coordinates. And then the two wave function also, two wave functions also use different bases for the spinners. So in the rest frame, we have the spinner basis, and in the light front, we use a helicity basis. And to go from one to another, we do this Mellos rotation, which is basically just a change of spinner basis. And then we have our light front wave function that we can use to calculate uh, the production. So let's consider what kind of results we get using the fully non-relativistic wave function and the 
relativistic with the v squared corrections. So here we are uh, plotting the total cross section in leading order in alpha s. The red dashed line here is the cross section using a fully non relativistic wave function. And the black solid line here, the NRQCD one, has these relativistic corrections of order v squared. And these gray error bands come from the uncertainties of the NRQCD matrix elements. So what we find uh, is that these relativistic corrections are most important at small values of q squared. And there's a significant difference between the two wave functions here. Whereas for large values of q squared, the differences are pretty small and drastic corrections are pretty much negligible. And we also find that this fully non-relativistic wave function overestimates the data here at small q squared, whereas this uh, one with the relativistic corrections uh, agrees with, with the data quite nicely for all values of q squared. And then we also consider this uh, nuclear suppression. So what we plot here is this ratio of the cross sections. So we compare the results that we get where, uh, with the case where in the initial state we have a heavy ion to the case where we have a proton. And this ratio is normalized in such a way that without any non-linear effects, it would be one. So any deviation from identity tells us about this nuclear suppression effects. And one might expect that in this ratio, the effects of the wave function cancel. But here we can see that this is not the case as at small q squared, uh, the difference between the two wave functions is large. So again, at small q squared, these effects, these relativistic effects are really important. And therefore it is uh, important to use a realistic wave function when comparing eventually to the EIC data. Uh, so now I will talk about this next to leading order corrections to the wave function and to the production uh, in the non-relativistic limit. So then one needs to take into, into account uh, Feynman diagram corrections like this to the wave functions of the virtual photon and the vector meson. And we have calculated uh, the production in the case where the uh, virtual photon is in the longitudinal polarization and we are right now calculating the transverse case also. So we'll talk about the results that we get using uh, with, with the longitudinal polarization. So first of all these different parts of the calculation all are UV divergent but when we sum them we get something that is UV finite. And we also get uh, cancellation of the infrared divergences but this is a little bit more complicated because one needs to take into account the renormalization of this leading order wave function phi and also the, iner the energy, depend energy dependence of the dipole amplitude, uh, which is described by this polisky kopchakov equation. And in the end, we get something uh, that is finite and can be numerically evaluated. So we took our analytical expression for the production amplitude and did the numerical, numerical calculations. So here are the results for the leading order and next to leading order production amplitudes. And we found that the next to leading order corrections are large. So they are about 75% of the leading order result. And they, this, this results in a significant increase of the production amplitude. However, uh, it's not actually this simple to compare the leading order and next to leading order results, because we also need this dipole amplitude that has an initial condition that is fitted to data. So here uh, we have plotted the dif uh, differential cross section at t equals zero for the case where we use different dipole amplitude fits. So the BK here uses leading order equations for structural functions to do the fit. And these other ones use next to leading order equations for the structural functions in the fit. And you can hear more about this uh, in Henry's talk after this one. So here in the dotted line, we have plotted uh, our result for the leading order differential cross section using the leading order dipole amplitude fit. 
and these other ones use the next to leading order uh, equation for the differential cross section with the next to leading order dipole amplitude fits. And you can see that the results that we get are not too different. They are certainly not that different that, than one might expect from the production amplitude plot. And here I have also plotted the ratios of the next leading order results to the leading order result. And you can see the uh, difference between the different dipole amplitudes here more clearly. So what this means is that uh, the leading order dipole amplitude fit can compensate for this next to leading order effects. But it is also interesting that this next to leading order dipole amplitude fits uh, have different results for the differential cross section. And this tells us that uh, this vector mesion production gives us complementary information to structure function analysis. Uh, Jan, you three minutes left. Okay, thank you. Uh, and this is because this process probes the target structure at different length scales than what the structure functions do. So in summary, uh, we determined the relativistic corrections of order P squared. And we also calculate the next to leading order corrections to the longitudinal production in the non-relativistic limit. And we found the relativistic corrections are important for small Q squared, but they become pretty much negligible at large Q squared. And we also found that the next leading order corrections are significant, but the leading order dipole amplitude fit can compensate for most of these next leading order effects. And in the future, we will calculate the next leading order corrections also to the transverse production. And this will allow us to compare the next leading order results to the data. And these are important developments as we expect to get precise measurements from the LAC and the electron ion collider in the future. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, a very nice talk. Uh, thank you. Uh, now we have time for questions. Um, we have uh, the first question from uh, Farid, please. Hi, Johnny. Very impressive talk and results. Thank you. I have many questions, but maybe let me start with one. Um, so you show the plots at t equal to zero. Um, yes. Do you expect the NLO to affect the spectra in t? Um, as we know, the spectra in t is conjugate to the impact parameter, right? But, um, that was discussed in the previous talk. Will it change the spectra? Uh, we have not looked at this yet, but uh, I would say that it probably, probably does not change it too much, but we have not looked at it yet. Okay, and uh, just one more quick question. Um, I think in figure six, uh, you show this nuclear suppression um, yeah. back. Do you understand why the nuclear suppression is reduced um, with the non-relativistic uh, QCD uh, matrix elements? I have not really thought about it, uh, but uh, we get similar results also with uh, other phenomenological wave functions. So this uh, NRQCD agrees quite well with the results that you get with other phenomenological wave functions. So um, this is... Mm, well, I don't really know why. Okay, fair enough. Thanks, Jan. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have another question from uh, from Jesus. Guillermo. Hi, here is Guillermo. Very nice talk, very interesting results. I have a naive question precisely in this slide. Uh, sorry, I'm not tourist and I don't follow very close all the calculation. What is the impact of this, what you, you show in this slide? with the NLO results that you show later on? Uh, do, do I carry them on? Or once you do the proper subtraction, this is not anymore that important? Well, we have not calculated this for the next to leading order corrections, because here we are using the total cross-section and we still need the transverse cross-section for the next to leading order calculations that we have not calculated. But do you expect that the, at the NLO order, 
you you would have an effect or, or do you need to do this uh, obligatory for the NLO or, or? Yeah, of course, we are going to look at this also in the next link order, but so far I cannot really say anything because the calculations have not been done. Okay, thanks. And I'm, I'm eagerly awaiting for the results to compare to the data that would measure. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I don't see any more questions uh, and comments. Uh, so uh, we can uh, move uh, to the next speaker. Uh, let's thank Jani uh, again. And the next speaker is Henry. Uh, Henry, could you please uh, share your screen? Yes. Uh, I see. Oh, um, uh, yeah. Now I see. Uh, next speaker is Henry, uh, who will uh, talk about next to leading order dipole vector fits uh, to Hera data. Uh, please go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, so, <clears throat> so I will discuss uh, our, our fits uh, done in collaboration with Guillaume, Thomas, and Heike that we published last year. So, uh, okay. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> so let's go start by looking at the DIS at the, uh, in the double pits of leading order, where after we factorize out the lepton, uh, the scattering proceeds <clears throat> by the virtual photon fluctuating into a quark anti quark dipole that then scatters iconally from the color field of the proton. And then uh, to get the inclusive uh, total projection, uh, it recombines uh, into, into a virtual photon. And the leading order projection uh, is a, a result like this, which is essentially a convolution between the perturbative. Uh, uh, photon splitting wave function, and then this dipole amplitude that is uh, <coughs> related to the uh, uh, dipole scattering matrix that we define using the Wilson lines of the quark and anti quark that uh, they pick up in the scattering. So then let's uh, look at the energy evolution of the target, which is described uh, approximately by the Palitsky Kovacic equation which is a differential equation uh, in rapidity for the scattering matrix. And to give you an idea of where it fits in a, a larger picture, uh, I show you uh, a schematic uh, figure with the D-club evolution on the horizontal axis. And then we have weaker evolution on the vertical axis that then takes the target towards saturation. And so this provides us with the perturbative energy evolution that uh, starts from a non perturbative initial shape. And this kind of a setup has been used in a number of uh, successful leading order studies. And here's just a few. And to put them in a nutshell, uh, they have described the inclusive error data uh, very well. Uh, but we have this uh, 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 additional detail that the, some of the description of the error heavy quark data has, has not been as good. So. So you can win, uh, fit uh, one or the other well. So then <clears throat> let's move on to next to leading order. <clears throat> so there the cross section can be written in this way where we have a lowest order contribution and then uh, two next to leading order contributions where one can think of this uh, quad gluon term to arise from the uh, three light NLO diagrams uh, where we have a three particle uh, sc uh, scattering state of the quad anti quad and gluon. And then this uh, double term uh, uh, arises from the loop contributions. And here I'll show you this uh, <clears throat> definition of uh, Z2, which is the longitudinal momentum fraction of the gluon at next to leading order. So the, uh, then the next to leading order contributions look like this, where we have a <clears throat> for the quark gluon term, uh, we have full NLO kinematics with three scattering particles. And then, uh, importantly, we have this uh, uh, logarithmic integral over the gluon uh, momentum fraction. And here, uh, 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 the Z2 minimum is important at NLO since the evolution range is controlled by this <clears throat> at NLO. So, so it ties into the factorization scheme that uh, needs to be used 
to to resume the large logarithm that arises from the soft clones in back into the pk evolution uh, uh, and so, so this is this is a important feature at nlo to get uh, controlled perturbative uh, expansion and then uh, the dipole contribution uh, has a uh, leading of the kinematics with two scattering particles with a correction from the loop integrals then uh, let's review our uh, fitting uh, setup so we can either parameterize the uh, initial condition of the bk at this uh, impact factor rapidity scale that is related to the z2 minimum or we can take a larger or later uh, rapidity and freeze the dipoles before before that scale and and for the parameterization we use the mv gamma model then we resolve the transient effect that we saw previously by setting the impact factor scale to uh, zero which is the minim minimal case and this means that we need a effective prescription for the dipoles if this uh, uh, rapidity range is non-empty which depends on this first choice so then uh, in our fits we are comparing a number of uh, bk prescriptions that are approximations of the full next to leading order bk and the, the <clears throat> there are two uh, rough approaches that have been used uh, to to get these enhanced equations first is this projectile momentum fraction ordering where uh, these uh, kinematical constant bk and this resin bk have been derived and then then the third one is a uh, newer one is this uh, target momentum fraction ordering which we call the uh, tbk and and finally we are then comparing two running coupling prescriptions first uh, aiming to be this uh, somehow more realistic one is this politiki plus small dipole prescription and we compare this to the simple Parent dipole prescription. So then let's uh, discuss the uh, enhanced peak equations. First, in the uh, projectile momentum fraction picture, where the evolution rapidity uh, y is related to the CMS energy in the spectrum. And in, in order to get these uh, uh, peak equations approximating the analog PK. Uh, one uh, uses resumation techniques to capture these important high order effects uh, that uh, that are manifested as these uh, uh, large transverse logs uh, going to high orders and these these are resumed so one approach that, that ha has been used is this collinear resumation of these logs uh, where the for which the result we call the resume bk and it's, it's a uh, modified BK uh, looking like this, where the resumation produces these uh, kernel modifications in the equation. Then a second approach produces this kinematical constraint, uh, and, and uh, this is now non-local in the evolution rapidity, and, and uh, no, the non-locality is manifested as these shifts here. And uh, the, the, both of these uh, uh, resume these uh, uh, essential uh, large logarithms so then the third uh, uh, option is this uh, uh, target momentum fraction ordering where the evolution rapidity eta is related to the x uh, and the uh, resumed uh, bk equation now looks like this uh, and this is now again uh, non-local in the in the eta evolution rapidity and now we have the uh, extra step that the evolution is derived in eta and the uh, idi's impact factors are derived in y so we need to shift between them here is the shift that we use and uh, already the uh, authors of this uh, derivation did the leading order di fits to her data uh, using this uh, <coughs> enhanced pk with good results so then let's move on to our fits so here's uh, Hera uh, Sigma reduced uh, as a function of the OpenX using the more realistic uh, running coupling, uh, parameterizing at uh, y0. And uh, there's a uh, one fit with each of the enhanced peak equations. And as you can see, all the three equations can fit the Hera data quite well. 
And we found uh, that uh, even the combined error data cannot really differentiate between the VK equations or the running tuples. And, uh, and lastly, the, the more realistic prescription for the running coupling seemed to uh, perform uh, slightly worse than chi squared. So then let's discuss heavy quarks. So since we are uh, working uh, with the <coughs> impact factors uh, uh, that are calculated for massless quarks, uh, we, we set out to fit this uh, light quark reduced cross section data that we, we generated from uh, header data by subtracting the heavy quarks uh, ourselves. And uh, since, since the uh, chum and bottom contributions are not measured in the same winds as the full cross sections, uh, we have to interpolate the heavy quark data with a separate, separate leading, leading order fit. And since uh, we are, uh, this is uh, somehow a, a, a quick look at the phenomenology, uh, we leave the uh, original error data uncertainties unmodified uh, since, since the uh, accurate uh, handling of the correlated uncertainties between these data sets should be done by the experimentalists. So, so we expect that uh, this, this incorrect treatment uh, mostly affects the chi-squared values of these light quark data fits and not so much the parameterizations that are found, which are uh, the interesting bit here for the phenomenological comparison between the data sets. So uh, here's a fit to the light quark data and a, a sister fit uh, to the hero data. So same BK and same running coupling two fits. Uh, and as you can see, uh, the ne next to leading order setup can fit these, these uh, light quark data as well. And we have some systematic findings from these fits. So the light quarks want a larger target size, which is the sigma zero, and they, they uh, need a larger C squared. And to help you see how the C squared behaves, uh, it, is, it is the scaling between the momentum and the, uh, position space prescriptions of the running coupling. And this has the effect that the larger C square um, slows down the PK uh, evolution of the target. And we interpret this uh, as a large, slowly evolving, non perturbative contribution in the data. And, uh, and uh, that the fit parameters effectively take into account these, these effects. And uh, just to quickly give you an idea of the uh, effect that we see. So, so first line is a error data fit, and the second line is a light work data fit with the same setup. So the target is a fair bit larger, and the uh, light works uh, wish for a fairly bit slower evolution as well. So then uh, let's move on to predictions at the LHC kinematics. This is F2 as a function of uh, Q squared extrapolated to fairly small BFNX. And here we are uh, comparing uh, uh, older leading order BK fit to three of our uh, fits with the enhanced BK equations. And as you can see, the, the NLO corrections have a... Uh, you have three minutes left. Thank you. Fairly consistent effect uh, comparing to the leading order. And uh, we learned that the anomalous dimension uh, evolves uh, differently in the Y and uh, eta pictures of the evolution. And uh, this uh, can have an effect on Q, the Q squared dependence of the resulting structural functions. And uh, however, uh, uh, at LHC kinematics, the differences are quite moderate. Then here, here are corresponding plot for FL with the uh, same curves. And as you can see, the, the effect is uh, slightly enhanced uh, between Y and evolutions. And this could be due to the fact that the uh, FL is uh, uh, more sensitive to smaller dipoles, uh, where the evolution equations uh, differ more. So then let's uh, lastly have a comparison with H1 measurement of FL. So we computed the uh, FL from our <coughs> Hera sigma reduced fits and uh, compare this to the H1 measurement as, as plotted here. And as you can see, the fits describe the FL uh, quite nicely. And the enhanced PK equations uh, behave equivalently here. 
and we would expect to start to see differences between the, these evolution equations when we do smaller bioconnects and uh, moderately high Q squared. So then to conclude, uh, we have performed the first next to leading order fits to HERA data and the all uh, enhanced PK equations describe the combined HERA data well. And uh, this has been important test for CGC at uh, next to leading order to really see that we can get the uh, perturbation at an NLO uh, uh, under control. And then uh, in the light block uh, only fits, we found, found the implied presence uh, of this uh, large non perturbative contribution, uh, which leads us to think that uh, it uh, could be preferable to fit a precise F2C. And, and uh, this can be and will be done once the massive massive quark impact factors become available at NLO. And lastly, uh, in the search of uh, differences between the PK prescriptions, uh, uh, we think that uh, precise precise data and a larger kinematical range could help to constrain the evolution equations to maybe start to see some differences between the capabilities. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, very nice talk. Uh, uh, we have a uh, first uh, question from uh, Jamar. Well, thanks. Uh, very nice talk. Uh, question about the old days, uh, people who fit the data realized there was this uh, kinematic window called the geometric scaling region. And uh, I was wondering if you have looked at it with this uh, NLO the calculations and whether these effects will uh, affect that window, especially the Rissom BK one. But it uh, seems like you're saying you all of them fit the data. So I wonder, uh, I'm wondering whether there will be any effect on how, how much that geometric scaling window is. Yeah, I haven't looked at that. And the considering how, how similarly they were capable, I, I don't, I'm not sure if if uh, uh, if there can be seen a difference, but uh, but I haven't looked at it. Okay, thanks. Uh, thank you. Uh, next question uh, is from Farid. Hi, Henry. Very Hi. nice. Uh, could you please go back to slide ten? Yep. Uh, on the plot on the left, um, I was curious what happens uh, with the set of Q square equal to 3.5 GV square at the small Bjork and X, there seems to be some kind of, the data seems to kind of go down. Uh, uh, do you mean here? Yes. Um, and that is the FL contribution. This is the reduced control section, not F2. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. And this only seems to happen at the lowest Q, Q square values, right? Is this, well, okay, there is no coverage for the small. Yeah, they might not, uh, um, yeah, they might not take coverage. Th that was it, thanks. Thanks. Uh, okay, thanks. Uh, the last short uh, question from Yasin. Yeah, it's gonna be short. So have you uh, explored the uh, theory and certainties um, of uh, this formalism? No, no, not very, not very extensively, no. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. Let's thank um, Tehani again. And uh, now we can continue with the next talk. The next speaker is uh, Martin. Martin, are you ready? Uh, could you please yes. share your screen? Um, I'm here, let me share. Um... Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, can you see the slides? No? Yes, yes, we can see. Uh, you can start, please. Okay, great. Um, yeah, thanks a lot for the opportunity to give this talk here and to present the work. I'm going to talk about uh, photovoltaics production at next leading order using the part of high energy vector action. In case you hear some noise here, it's just the dog, it's just a mori. I tried to calm her down, but uh, it doesn't work really. So sorry for that. But I think we can manage it in that way. That happens now when you have to do things online. 
Okay, good. So that's um, that's the, um, the general the general feature you want to do here. I want to present this on calculation, which is based on this uh, formalism, um, but on, based on the part of sinusoidal action. So the, the part of sinusoidal action is a way that you allows your way how to to, to factorize in the high energy limit um, a certain general correlator into into sub pieces into sub sectors, which are all themselves uh, local in uh, in rapidity. And then when each subsector here is then by, by itself significantly separated from each other in, uh, in rapidity. So this action exists here. Here in this case, I'm going to talk about this action which is uh, formulated for, um, for regex gluons, for gluonic exchanges, which is, um, so give me a second. Um, <clears throat> which, is, um, which is formulated for, um, for, 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 for gluons. So now in that case here, so those are different actions here, which are formulated for HS quarks and for electrophilic bosons. So you can also take a look at them, but here for a dominant case, we're dealing here with the gluon case only. And uh, <clears throat> so what is the basic idea of this formalism is the formula the idea is to, to factorize specialty amplitudes in the energy limit through introducing a new kind of field, a new kind of degree of freedom, the so-called uh, regis gluon. So which here in this context is always denoted by the a plus is minus so that's another regex gluon field the conventional gluon field would be then the u u field this regex gluon field um, is then sub subject to the following kinematic constraint so this essentially imposes strong ordering in light cone momenta between these different sectors which are all strongly uh, which are separated in uh, rapidity and then uh, the underlying concept and that's why this is a particularly beautiful picture is is the following that these regex gluon fields that they are defined to be invariant under local gauge transformations, and therefore we achieve in this formalism a gauge invariant factorizations of uh, of the sectors here. And then, uh, <clears throat> yeah, and then how is this done in practice? So in practice, what this means is, so we describe our in, our interactions in some certain local sectors. So for instance, here in the emission of uh, this quark here, we, just, we can describe this using two elements. So one element here is the standard QCD action. For instance, it is here through this uh, free gluon vertex. The other mechanism is now then through iconal emissions, as we have again, those in line, those in line factors, iconal factors, which take your account emissions, which are common regions, which are far away in rapidity. And then combining both of elements, you get here a uh, gauge invariant description of this uh, local crystal dynamics. And therefore you can then separate UP dynamics in a, in a an appropriate way. Um, this action is now um, available for, for quite a while. So we've seen it uh, has been proposed in, in 96. And uh, <clears throat> now myself and other collaborators of myself are working on this kind of projects now maybe for 10 years or so, more or less. And, uh, and the really, in the meanwhile, we have, we have been able to establish here a couple of non trivial tests of, of this kind of formalism. So one of them here was, was the calculation of, of the two loop blue trajectory. So that really required the evaluation of a, of a, a couple of, of diagrams and then uh, then we could check here our, our, our way how to deal here with uh, this kind of uh, yeah with this kind of um, yeah, factorization this kind of uh, also, also how to remove develop the mechanism how to remove some some double counting or not double counting more like how to how to separate pieces which are which which are double in, in the in the in the two loop so the one loop so it is a one loop expression which appears and also in the two loop result you found a way how to remove that and then finally we could we could establish then from get here the the two loop, the complete two loop gluon trajectory. And then that's not the only result which, uh, which is able, which you can get using the, that kind of formalism. Also, there's a lot of studies which are, which address here the, the, the exchange of multi regex gluon exchanges. Um, particularly, it was, it was impossible also to, uh, to derive from, from, from this kind of um, framework the so called ballistic Zimbog evolution. And, and this, in this sense, it can, uh, you can really claim that actually the whole, the whole formalism is also completely equivalent to the. <clears throat> To the to the color glass condensate formalism as a dipole dipole picture, all these kind of things they, they go in, in the same order. So they have, there's no difference here. It is just a different way to, to formulate sort of the, the same kind of physics. Huh? And then um, and then here you see a couple of more processes which we calculated. So for instance, uh, this uh, NLO in the factors with, uh, for the jets with and without the pretty gaps. And then uh, and then also it exists uh, as a complementary formalism that existed with uh, spin helicity amplitudes. We sort of allow to calculate one of these, uh, yeah, in a certain dilute region to calculate this kind of amplitudes in energy factorization in a, in a very efficient way. So, in the end, I think it is fair to say that it's in general a well tested effective action formalism. 
and uh, it's it's a uh, it's an economic way and a good way to 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 start in, in using this kind of formalism amplitudes within uh, high energy capitalization. So what I'm going to tell you talk to you about now today is a very particular process. So I'm going to discuss in now Higgs production in the in, in the forward direction of of so I have a collision of two protons and then the forward direction of one of the protons I am one of produce a Higgs particle. And then, in principle, the Higgs particle is then separated by a large difference in rapidity from the fragmentation regions of the, of the second proton. Now, um, for Higgs, so the first thing, of course, when somebody talks like this, talk about Higgs production, you will think this might be a talk about Higgs chronology, and maybe that should be given either in the electro Higgs session or something like that. But, uh, but in the end, um, <clears throat> so, if, so if, if one is honest, um, this kind of event here is only relevant for Higgs chronology for, for events which identify really the. <clears throat> which can identify here uh, really a Higgs in, in the forward in the, in, in the forward direction. So um, my personal guess would be it is not, it is not too relevant. Nevertheless, there are some uh, attempts to, to now study as we've seen already, I think it was in, this, uh, in one of the talks of this session by that uh, one can also study events where we have here a Higgs particle in, in the forward direction, then a jet in, in the backward direction, and then and study here the, the difference here in uh, the dependence of the scatter of the source direction on, the, on this uh, difference in ability. And then involve here as a measure of the scale effects. So for that, of course, it might be uh, might be useful. Uh, it might be a useful result for the get here. And then the the initial motivation for us to actually to look at this whole thing can actually commercially come from, from a different kind of corner. We have from, since uh, since a couple of years, so myself and then my collaborators from uh, from Krakow and then also people are spreading out over the world. We've been uh, we've been working here on uh, on defining a certain. Uh, combined D club and BFK low X evolution scheme using some T transverse momentum dependent splitting kernels. And then uh, it was for us a very, it will be a very important checkup to have here explicit, explicit um, and a low calculation, which we can then check on our, our yeah, also our factorization approach and then, uh, yeah, and to, and to cross text results and, and this kind of thing. So that was maybe here the initial motivation for us to, to make this calculation. But, uh, but of course, uh, in general, the result should be also applicable for Higgs chronology because, of course, that's what is initially intended for to, to work for. Huh? Good. So, um, so how should we organize now this uh, this next new order calculation in this framework? So uh, we should uh, we should generally follow here this this um, this, uh, this this picture, which we have developed here for the determination of the two loop trajectory. Um, we know that works, so so we should uh, rely on this formalism. So in our case here, um, we have in our we, this was in our calculation which only involved brittle corrections. So now in our case, both the field corrections. Essentially, the whole thing goes should nevertheless follow the same procedure. The only difference is that now we have to deal here with the complete multi kinematics. We have various emissions which are ordered in ability, but which have arbitrary transit momenta, and therefore we need to generalize our formalism to. To, uh, yeah, to formulate it using convolution integrals instead of products, which in general is not a problem because that also happens in other, other frameworks such as collinear factorization. So, I mean, again, we just have to generalize our formalism in an appropriate way. Yeah? So, there's nothing big to, to happen. So, the starting point of them to, to actually address all this framework is now hybrid factorization. So, we, we treat here the, the protons coming from the, from the proton in the forward direction. So, they're coming from, from that proton here. We treat them within conventional uh, collinear factorization. The protons coming from from uh, from that proton from that side that dealt with in high energy factorization. So we have here our conventional uh, collinear proton distributions, and here an integrated gluon distributions of uh, of the second proton. So <clears throat> which is of course eliminated in the x limit. So it involves uh, this off shell, um, <clears throat> and is uh, within this high energy effective action framework is well defined as a gauge invariant quantity through the through the two regress gluon state. And then finally, for us here, the object of interest would be now this coefficient at next living order, which then described us here the production of the Higgs particle in the forward direction. For the moment here, we don't include multi register student exchanges, so, so identity effects, they are the left aside for the moment. In principle, that is all possible, but uh, it's beyond this work, uh, so you can have to look at this separately. Of course, phenomenologically, maybe Higgs production is not the first test of, uh, of the color glass condensate, but, but anyway, no, we could do it anyway one day, maybe even for. For checking might be useful. Then, and, and, and so what I still want to tell you is we didn't organize our calculation here for this coefficient in, in the following way. We have here a leading order part and the next leading order piece. The leading order piece is simply defined as here some, some general coefficients, which, which uh, get, get us some numbers. And then here's some delta function. So it tells us that the transit momentum of the Higgs particle is equal to transit momentum that comes here from the high energy field, from the high energy gluon. 
And then uh, <clears throat> we describe here Higgs production now using this uh, effective uh, Lagrangian, which is yeah, uh, with, a, with a top loop to which, which is the, with, yeah, you know, you're alone or the gluon coupled through a top loop to the Higgs particle. Now we develop, we, 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 yeah, we reduce, we, we simplify this top loop by taking the top, the top mass to infinity. And then we work with this effective Lagrangian, which essentially allows, allows us to couple directly the Higgs field to the, to the, to the gluonic field. Yeah? And then this, uh, this coefficient here is well known. It's been calculated in a perturbation theory and then it's even up to higher orders. But we hear from the next link order calculation, we're always need only with the, the first term yeah, in this correction. All the virtual corrections for this kind of observable, they've been calculated before. They've been um, determined by Benevedov. Um, <clears throat> you, you see here below the result, the, uh, the UC as a, as a regulator for repeated divergences, or the high energy divergences, the, the tilt the Wilson lines are actual factors against the light cone with this parameter rho, and then rho is then pushed to infinity. So when you know when rho is close to infinity, we go back again to the, the usual light cone directions. And then this rho is then used to parameterize our divergences. So we get here in that just in the result here, so we have here a factor minus rho, which is then divergent there because we push this to infinity. But well, this divergence com comes now with the coefficient, which is C A over epsilon. And then if you come if you include now here also this overall all the S factors and all that, then you can realize that this is just nothing. But the general, yeah, one loop gluon trajectory. So, uh, so yeah, the, the divergence. Uh, you, have, uh, you have three more minutes. Good, sure, I, I will do, thanks. And, and we get the result here. Now we get here uh, something similar. Now we come to real corrections. That's, of, that's of our, our calculation, our result here. So also here we have to put here our regulator to, to regulate the rapidity of uh, this additional limited gluon. We calculate these corrections using three different methods. The one was really directly from the high energy effective action. The other one used uh, some KT factorization approach and light gauge, and finally we used also cross check using the KT Monte Carlo. So in all three cases, the results agree, and we also further cross check them against the green results, which have been calculated by Dawson in 99. So I think the results are probably correct. And then once we have these results ready, we, we're still not yet done because we still need to define our, our coefficient. So this defines now three prin um, principles of normalization. So one is ultraviolet normalization, that is just a standard thing as it goes usually. Then we have to also remove your contributions due to the external leg, so due to the initial red size gluon, due to the initial um, yeah, collinear gluon. This one here uh, involves here the one loop atomic pattern distributions. For the other one, for the red size gluon, for, for the energy gluon, we need uh, this one loop integrated gluon distribution, which takes uh, the following form. It is both the version contributions, but also finite terms, which uh, corresponds to the running coupling corrections to the gluon self energy. Um, this, uh, the, the precise form of these terms it can be motivated by essentially by, by taking here the one loop result and then here also again the factorized contribution though here we have emission power by rapidity which is also appears in this effective framework so we need to remove this piece from the complete one loop result and essentially we achieve that through subtracting that from the one loop result and then we get here our yeah we get here a calculation which is uh, finite and uh, which is uh, which we can take and for the complete result we can uh, put push now row to infinity the divergences we could cancel and we have uh, no overlap anymore between the different diagrams. Now to make this something still something useful, it's, uh, it's, it's a good idea to introduce now some transition functions, which can really make these cancellations of these raw divergences between different pieces to make it, to make it really uh, transparent, to make it obvious. So, so we did that, it was done already for the, also for the tulip prune trajectory, but now we do that here in a, in a, in a case of convolution integrals to take into account the transmental dependence, which now happens here in the, in the, in the how do you call it? In, in our case, in the case of real corrections, <clears throat> we, um, we did that. And then uh, we get our result in this, in this form. Now, a last thing before I wanna finish here, what I wanna tell you is, so our result now is, is unfinished. We, it, uh, it is, it in general, our result still has uh, one web epsilon, one web epsilon square holes, which corresponds to, to real, to, um, to soft and collinear singularities. It can be shown that these things, uh, singularities cancel relatively easily between real digital corrections. But still, um, <clears throat> using so-called phase-based slicing methods, nevertheless, for numerics, there is something which is not so nice. So for numerics, it would be, it would be far nicer to use something like dipole substructure, as a long time ago formulated by Catani and Zimbo for the standard collinear calculation. So here now, we, we do know something similar. Also for our calculations, for the high-energy factorized calculations, we essentially we make it some model, some model approach for the, for the, so we make it some simplified uh, ex expression, which allows us to abstract the diversion part of the real corrections and then make integrals here analytically and then add them back to the, to the virtual corrections. 
and then make and then really make this uh, kind of cancellations between the version C uh, explicit. Now that is essentially now my last slide. So <clears throat> sorry for running over time. So the one la last thing which is also very important here now is what our result now is so far now still formulated for for rapidity. So we have your factorization in, in rapidity. Now very often in for phenology, we would like to have here instead of resumption of rapidity, but in, in in log one of x because that's the standard variable for anti loon distributions. So uh, we also can now formulate here um, a change in the scale, which would be very nice to explain to you now, but I think I'm running out of time. So I, I guess I leave this slide here and that go to my conclusion and um, <clears throat> and just sum up what we did here. So we said we derived this coefficient for vortex production. We, uh, <clears throat> we, we, we post these new transition functions, which now allow to cancel as high energy divergences for this coefficient in a, in a systematic way. Um, we also um, we developed sort of a first step towards a type of structure mechanism to have a real virtual divergences cancel cancellations for our coefficients. And, uh, and currently, what we are undertaking is we want to do some numerical studies when they see that this uh, subtraction mechanism actually really works, that there's some that it really gives us a good, good and fine description. You are now on that, and I hope I can report soon on, on further results. So, thanks a lot for the, for the time, and, uh, and sorry for the interruption in the beginning. Okay, thank you, Martin, uh, for a very good talk. Uh, thanks. Uh, now we have time for questions, comments. Um, do we have any questions? Uh, yes, we have Jamal. Oh, thanks. Uh, uh, very nice talk, Martin. Uh, just wondering in this uh, Lipatov effective action approach, uh, is it known how to implement diffraction? Diffraction, yes, you could. Well, we did one calculation for, for diffraction. It was, um, there was these calculations for this Miller Navale jet, Miller, Miller, Miller Tang jet. So this change when you have here a, yeah, a jet, and then uh, I have no picture here for that to show you. Um, I'm afraid not. It would, be the, it would be the case when instead of, uh, when you have here a, a okay, so in this picture here, so if you have two protons and you would have here a jet in the forward direction, let's say produced. But then instead of here, the, the, the full region here filled up with, with emissions, we would have instead here an exchange of, um, of, uh, of, of uh, you have a color singlet, and then you would take, you could sort of describe your autodefractive reactions. So this would then require here an exchange of at least two radialized gluons of higher states. So, um, so one can do that, but, um, but I mean, we had also talk on this calculation. So somebody was, some people, are brave people really still trying to implement that in uh, for, for actually phenology. And uh, it's uh, it's not that easy. Uh, it's, uh, the, the, the whole framework is not very very compact. I'd say for this kind of calculations, unfortunately. Okay, thank you. Sure. Mm -hmm, okay. Uh, I don't see any more questions. Uh, so uh, let's thank uh, Martin again. And now we are moving to the next ne next talk. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Ksenia. Uh, good afternoon, good morning. I'm just trying to put my slides. Okay. Uh, uh, yes, so we can see. Uh, okay, uh, you can start. Perfect, thank you. Uh, so I will present a few new results with uh, CMS Precision Procton Spectrometer. And uh, let me start from just introducing the subdetector. We call it in short PPS. And it's forward proton spectrometer that's designed for operation in regular high intensity runs of LHC, just like CMSs. Uh, we have collected more than 110 inverse interburn of data in uh, the run two. And the idea here is that uh, this subdetector is essentially extending forward coverage of CMS on both sides from the interaction point. Uh, you can see here the schematic layout of uh, various CMS subsystems in the tunnel. So this is the central part of uh, CMS and we have PPS Roman pods uh, sitting at around 220 meter, meters away from the interaction point. This is only one arm being shown and uh, on the left arm, there happens exactly the same. 
Uh, PPS provides unique opportunity to probe gamma gamma and gluon gluon collisions at such hadron with such collider. And then uh, central exclusive production events uh, having PPS allows us to reconstruct the full collision energy, which is very beneficial for any physics searches. Uh, if you are interested uh, to dive a bit deeper into details of reconstruction, which I am not uh, touching in this talk, I invite you to have a look at talk by Fabrizio that has happened uh, yesterday. Few words about PPS physics motivation. So, as I already mentioned, primary goal is to study central production in gamma gamma or gluon gluon collisions. You can see on the right here a few uh, diagrams that are illustrating such type of processes. And proton tag advantages are closure of event kinematics. We also can achieve through this uh, very effective uh, rejection of background. And also, we can reduce uh, theory uncertainties, which are coming from proton dissociation. Uh, this all taken together allows us to access a really wide range of topics. One can look for anomalous couplings, one can try to search for new resonances or even study proton structure. All right, let's have a look at some uh, physics results. This is first one from 2016. Uh, this is about semi-exclusive dielectron production uh, via photon exchange and proton-proton collisions. Uh, with 2016 data, I mean. And uh, the final state in this case uh, is either one or two forward protons and the dielepton. Uh, on the right, uh, both these cases are illustrated. Uh, the idea here from the physics point of view is just to look for a simple standard model process and explore correlation between kinematics of dielepton that measured uh, by central part of CMS and that of uh, forward protons. Uh, in this case, we, of course, consider both double and single tagged uh, dielectron events just in order to get more statistics. Um, so in case if everything goes as expected and calibration works well, we will obtain a validation of optics and alignment, which are essential parts of our calibration. And also as a very nice bonus on top of this, we will get an observation of first proton tagged gamma gamma collisions at uh, electroweak scale. Uh, what is the strategy for this measurement? So there is one key proton variable that's delivered by PPS, and it's a relative momentum loss uh, xi. So we are looking for correlation between direct uh, xi measurement by PPS and compared to uh, the same measurement uh, that's calculated from uh, the lepton system that's uh, measured by central uh, subdetectors of CMS. There is this very simple relation you see uh, at the middle of the slide. We just use uh, PT and uh, the rapidity of leptons in order to, to calculate this uh, xi. Uh, there are two different solutions. One corresponds to protons uh, on the right side from CMS and the other to the uh, protons on the left side from CMS. Uh, of course, we expect some background contribution in this case. It will be coming mainly from drell yan and also double dissociation processes. Uh, it's uh, true that neither of those has any uh, final state forward protons. However, uh, both of them will fake signal by simply overlapping with pileup or beam halo protons. Uh, however, the good news is that uh, all those contributions can be really largely suppressed by uh, applying selection cuts. All right, this is final result of this strategy and this approach. We are looking here at uh, XI relations. There are two plots because we have symmetric detector with two arms, left arm and right arm. Uh, what is plotted on x-axis is measurement of xi derived by PPS, and y-axis is uh, the same variable, but calculated from the leptons. Uh, the diagonal here corresponds, of course, to the case of perfect correlation between two measurements. So we are expecting that our signal will be sitting along this diagonal with some uh, spread corresponding to uh, resolution of both of some detectors. Indeed, we, uh, we observe an enhancement. Uh, in total, we are getting 20 events with matching kinematics. Of them, 12 are diamonds and 8 are uh, dielectrons. Uh, talking about background, it's uh, expected to be 1.49 events for diamonds and a bit larger, 2.36 for dielectrons. If we combine this all together, we get a combined significance of uh, more than 5.1 sigma. So indeed, this uh, corresponds to an observation. Let's have a look. Uh, a bit closer at the signal candidate properties. So we just take uh, diagonal events from this slide, from these plots, and we plot them 
in mass versus rapid space of the leptons. Uh, we can see that the lepton mass and rapidity consi are consistent with single arm acceptance that is shown here in yellow color. We haven't seen any double tact events in this uh, data set. Uh, they would have been here, but uh, those two events, which uh, you can see here, still were single tact only. However, this is not uh, very surprising because if one looks at standard model cross section and uh, convolutes it with uh, efficiency of PPS. Indeed, it's a very small number, which is almost negligible. Uh, we also see that mass of those events extends to up uh, up to about 900 GV, which uh, gives a signal that indeed we see first act gamma-gamma uh, collisions at the electric scale, which is a very nice result. Uh, this all was about 2016 data. One may ask what about the rest of the run two? Uh, indeed, we have uh, taken a look already at 2017 and 2018 data. There is a really nice uh, increase in luminosity, so almost 10 times more, 92 uh, inverse femtobarm. Uh, all these data have been calibrated and analyzed uh, with this channel, and uh, here we are showing just the diamond channel. Uh, again, you probably recognize already those plots, so it's just a relation between uh, two side measurements, and there is a uh, very clear this time enhancement along the uh, diagonal, quite undeniable. And also there is a blob of uh, background events that are coming from pylon. Uh, what we have done on top of this, you can see at the bottom of the slide, it's uh, plotting, taking these two arms together and plotting one dimensional distribution, just ratio between xi of protons and uh, xi uh, recovered from diamonds. And uh, we compare it to Monte Carlo, which is shown in blue, and uh, background shape uh, that's derived from data and fitted to this uh, pedestal of the peak. Uh, the left plot is everything together, of course, and the right plot is the same, but with background subtracted and also uncertainty shown on top. Uh, we see that the peak is really nicely positioned around zero, as expected, uh, if the calibration is correct. And uh, we also managed to describe well the position, the width with uh, simulation. Uh, this confirms the accent reconstruction and Monte Carlo simulation performance for the run two. And this means that the full data set is ready for any uh, run two analysis, many of which are uh, in progress right now. Uh, that's all for the leptons. Let's have a look at some other channel. Uh, this would be about exclusive diphoton production at high mass. Uh, this analysis is searching for BSM contribution to the light by light scattering cross section. And uh, the signature is similar, but in this case, it's two forward protons and a diphoton between them, as is shown on the right. Um, as you probably know, CMS and Atlas have reported very nice observation of light by light event, uh, events, uh, light by light scattering events, and they have uh, found candidates for diphoton masses of a few GV. Uh, the specifics of this analysis is that uh, we are looking into uh, diphoton spectrum that's about 350 GV, which is explored, in fact, for the first time at the Hadrat Collider in uh, this type of analysis. Uh, we have, we face few challenges. Uh, first is low process cross section, it's just few femtobarn for elastic standard model production. And also, there are large theoretical uncertainties. Anyway, let's look what uh, what we get. This is diphoton mass spectrum. This is 2016 data, 9.4 inverse centibarn. Uh, for the selection cut, just to give some general ones, it's, uh, of course, mass, mass of diphoton greater than 350 GV. Uh, PTO of each of the photons is greater than 75 GV. And also, we are um, benefiting from exclusivity of the signal and putting a cut on a coplanarity of uh, photons. Uh, this spectrum on the right is shown before ADPPS proton requirement, so it's only with uh, cuts on central uh, variables of uh, CMOS. And uh, the main ground here is coming from inclusive gamma gamma and inclusive gamma plus jet with standard model contribution shown uh, in green and uh, magnified by 5,000 times. Uh, all right, then once we have this distribution, we can also require on top of this uh, a pair of four proton tracks. So one track on the left side from CMS, other on the right side from CMS, uh, left and right arms of EPS, of course. 
And uh, after such requirement, we uh, do not observe any events in signal region. And we calculate that the background aspect that is 0 0.23 events. Um, this allows us, of course, to set an upper limit on the exclusive diphoton production cross section, which amounts to 4.4 femtobar at 94, uh, 95 sorry, confidence level. Uh, this is uh, the first ever collider limit on the four photon anomaly square gauge coupling. A uh, very nice result, and of course, it would benefit from uh, analyzing the rest of the run to data with more statistics. All right. Uh, bit more technical topic, the last one. It's about uh, run two timing performance. So in addition to measuring proton xi momentum loss, PPS is also able to derive a measurement of proton time of arrival. Uh, this is great variable because what one can do is to compare predicted vertex position from the time of arrival of the proton to the traditional uh, CMS vertex uh, position measurement just from the tracking. Uh, and uh, in this plot, we are trying to quantify uh, vertex resolution that we can obtain with uh, uh, PPS. And on the left plot here, you can see uh, this 2D distribution with CMS vertex uh, coordinates shown on the x-axis and PPS uh, delta T shown on the y-axis. Uh, the ideal correlation would be along the red line and uh, data points are in black. and the profile plot, plot that gives an, an idea of correlation in the data is in blue here. Uh, we can see that uh, there is pretty nice uh, dependence of one variable uh, from another. They are correlated. Uh, these are 2018 low pile updates, which we have selected just to uh, quantify the performance of this um, timing setup. Uh, what we do next, we just uh, try to estimate resolution, as I mentioned, and we combine those variables and just plot this one-dimensional plot and uh, extract the resolution by fitting uh, two uh, distributions, one for signal component and one for background component, and this results in vertex resolution of 1.87 centimeters, which, if you divide it by uh, speed of light, is about 60 picoseconds. Uh, we see that resolution is dominated by single arm detector Actually, and electronics. Three minutes left. Thank you. Uh, yes, and electronics performance. And uh, this resolution is expected to degrade by about 15 or 25 picoseconds between uh, the slow pile up data and um, the physics data that we uh, would, uh, that we see at the end of uh, run two. Right. What about future analysis with PS? Uh, there is, in fact, a myriad of accessible topics. Here are just a few examples, if you are curious. Uh, one can look from Higgs to some more exotic uh, topics like magnetic monopoles, Susie, and so on. Uh, for the run three, uh, our goal is to acquire 300 inverse centibarn of data. We expect to get uh, quite a few new opportunities with introduction of PPS at HLT trigger. Uh, we would benefit for both um, from this trigger for both automatized calibration of the detector and also for uh, physics searches. Also, uh, we are aiming to upgrade VPS timing system to reach uh, 30 picosecond resolution, which will be uh, an additional very powerful tool to combat the background. All right, this brings me to my summary slide. So we have presented several public VPS results based on 2016 data. This is the first observation of tagged gamma-gamma collisions at the electroweak scale, and also the first collider limit on four-photon anomalous aquatic gauge coupling. Uh, there is extensive work ongoing on full run to analysis, and we hope to start re releasing more uh, very soon. And also, there are quite exciting prospects for run three, uh, where we hope to benefit from our uh, run to experience and more data and more powerful tools for uh, signal extraction. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you very much for this very interesting talk. Uh, now we have time for questions, uh, comments. Uh, we have a question from Paul. Hi, th thank you for the beautiful results and nice talk. 
Um, I, I'm, I'm a bit confused by the statement that this is the first collider limit on anomalous cortic gauge coupling for four photons. I mean, hasn't light by light scattering been observed at the LHC? And was that really not used to set a limit? Or is it? Uh, or I, think, I think we are speaking just about the different uh, mass range here, as I mentioned ah, here. Okay. So uh, CMS and Atlas, of course, uh, were pioneering this uh, observation, but they had candidates for diphaton masses just few GV. Here we are jumping about 350. Uh, okay. And it's certainly the first for, first result with tag for tag protons. So congratulations. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, do we have uh... Uh, so I, I don't see any more questions. Uh, I think uh, we can move to, to the um, last uh, talk of this session. Uh, the last speaker is uh, Christoph. Uh, Christoph, uh, could you please share your screen? Yes, so thank you. So let me share. So you do, do you see it? Uh, not yet. Yes, yes, we can okay. see. Very good. Thank you. So what I will discuss today is basically the observation of the exchange of a colorless C-odd gluonic compound, or what we call basically the, the odoron. So what I will first introduce very briefly, what is the odoron? I mean, to know what we are talking about. Then I will introduce the D0 and totem data, see how to extrapolate the totem data to the energy. I mean, I will discuss about this. And then finally compare between both data sets which leads basically to the observation. So before going into the detail, let me introduce very briefly what is the gluon exchange in hadron hadron scattering. I mean, this is the, the plot on the upper left, which is the so-called Bartels fushinsky prasalovic uh, model. And uh, we, we find, first of all, from the, the people that introduced the other ones, so it was Nicolescu et al. And from Basarab Niskolescu, the other one is defined as a singularity in the complex plane located at j equal one when t is equal to zero and which contributes to the odd crossing amplitude. So this is the definition given by its authors, but it's a bit maybe complicated to follow. That's why I introduced the diagram on the right, which shows both the, the Pomeron and the, the other one. In fact, this multi-gluon exchange, so you can get two gluon exchange, three gluon exchange, so the pomeron in order to get a colorless exchange so this is basic and for the other one the lowest order would be three gluon exchange and in fact the fact that we have two or three gluon exchange this predicts some differences between elastic cross-section for proton-proton and proton-anti-proton -proton interactions. So this is what we aim to observe. So let me just a bit in indicate what is the elastic scattering at Evatron or LHC. So you have this kind of observable, I mean, just the scale elastic scattering. So for instance, proton, proton going to proton-proton. And there is exchange of momentum between the two protons, which remain intact in the final state. We measure these intact protons in dedicated detectors called Roman pots. So we heard the, the talk by Xenia, I mean, who were mentioning these Roman pots. So we just use them in a different kinematical domain. And we count the number of events as a function of t, where t is the quadrimomentum transferred square at the proton vertex. This is measured again by detecting and tracking the protons. So basically, we can get this d sigma dt, which is expected to have this kind of structure. So at the very low t, you have what you call the Coulomb domain. Then you go to the nuclear domain, which is exponential dependence as a function of t. There is the interference region between this Coulomb and nuclear domain. We'll see in the following that this will be relevant for what we discuss. Then maybe there are some structures, some resonances, and it was already apparent, for instance, at the, the ISR uh, before a previous experiment as lower square root of s. And then at some point, you raise the domain of perturbative QCD, where you get t to minus a dependence. So this is what we expect. So let me now introduce the measurement that were performed first by D0 and then by total. 
So, you know, D0 was the uh, one of the two experiments at the Tevatron. So there were D0 and CDF. And D0 installed some Roman pod detectors in order to detect both intact proton and antiprotons, because you remember that the Tevatron was a PP bar collider. The center of mass energy was almost 2 TeV, so 1.96 TeV exactly. And so D0 measure the PV bar elastic data again by detecting both the proton and the antiproton. And this is the measurement of D0 on the left, which is the elastic cross section as a function of. So you see the triangles that correspond to the D0 measurement. So now let me move to the totem measure. Totem did basically the same kind of thing, installed Roman pot detectors in order to detect intact proton in the final state. So in our case, elastic protons. The advantage of the, the DLHC is that there were very precise measurements that were performed at many different square root of S energy. So I'm quoting 2.76, 7, 8, and 13 TV. And as we will see in the following, this was really fundamental for our study. So I just illustrate, I mean, the three of the four measurements. For instance, we have here 2.76 in the, the middle. On the left, you have 8 TV. And then on the right, the 13 TV measurement. And what you see on this uh, plot, even if it's small, is that you only see the points. You don't even see the uncertainties. You don't see the error bars. This show the kind of precision that was achieved on the elastic cross-section measure. So what is now, let's define what is the strategy to compare proton-proton and proton-antiproton data sets. Because of course, no, the tricky part is that we have proton-proton data at 2.76, 7, 8, and 13 TV, and PP bar data at 1.96 TV. So they are not at the square, same square root of S. So on the same plot, I mean, to be able to compare them, so what you see, they show the same feature, basically. They all have a kind of a minimum, then a maximum, and then it goes down again. So basically, at all square root of S, you see the same tendency for all the value of the sigma dt. Whereas if we go back one second from the D0 data, this is not at all visible in the D0 data, which seems rather flat at higher values of t. So this was basically the general idea to compare both data sets is to quantify in different ways the fact that the data show a maximum and a minimum. So the first aspect, which is the, the easiest one, was to compute what is the bump over deep ratio. I mean, this will be very simple. You, you do it as a function of square root of S, and you compare the values that are obtained for PP or PP bar interaction. PP interaction is basically the curve, which is here in red with the different data points. At low energy, this is the ISR, and you see the at higher energy, which is basically the totem measurements, which are the black points. And this is compared with PP bar interactions, which are all the points that are here below. And you see that basically the, the ratio that we obtain for PP bar interaction is close to one, whereas it's clearly different one, even at higher energy, when we look at the totem data. So if we already at this level, we see that there is more than three sigma difference between PP and PP bar elastic data. And then if we assume that nothing strange appears between below 100 GeV and 1 TeV, that we get something which is continuous, this is an assumption. So, okay, this was a kind of starting point, but we wanted to do something a bit more, a bit better, a bit more quantitative than this pure measurement. So what is the basic idea? is to try to characterize the, the dip and the maximum of the elastic data directly from the total measurement. So there is the, the sketch, which is here on the left. So what we want to do is to identify the few points. For instance, there are two of them which are obvious, which is the bump and the dip. But we have other points, like, for instance, the same value at the sigma dt at IRT, which we call dip2 or the same value as the bump in the sigma dt, but at lower t, which we call bump two. And we defined in addition, some other points, which we call mid one and mid two, that correspond to half the cross section between the dip and the bump. In addition, we have two other points, which we call bump plus five and bump plus 10, that corresponds to five times the difference between the bump and the dip, or 10 times this difference. 
So why do we do this? We want to have some kind of a characteristic point that are characteristic of the shape of this PP elastic cross section so that we can see how these points vary as a function of square root of s. Why is it important? Because again, we need to extrapolate our knowledge to the Tevatron energy. So we need to have a kind of characteristic knowledge of this data, and we want to be as model independent as possible. Because of course, some people can do some fits and so on, but then you have model dependency of your results, and you want to get something which is more model independent. So I would say from this point of view that we use also data points directly. So in the case that, of course, we don't have exactly the bump, but the data points is close to the bump, for instance, to the left, we use the data points that are closest to those characteristic points. This avoid, again, model dependencies. And in case we have two adjust adjacent deep on bump points, for instance, or about equal value, we merge the data, the, the data bits. So let me before showing the fit. So this gives me basically this kind of values that are here. On the left, you see the value of t as a function of square root of s for the different eight points that I just introduced, like the bump, the dip, dip two, mid two, and so on and so forth. And on the right, you see the elastic cross section, the value of this sigma dt for this point, again, as a function of square root of s. So now what we need to do is to understand basically how this point vary as a function of square root of s in order to extrapolate the result down to Tevatron energy. For this, we fit all the reference points using this log square root of s term, so a linear term in log square root of s for the t value, and a square root of s dependence for the sigma dt. So what is quite surprising, and this is an assumption that works basically, is that we use the same form for all the eight reference points. There may be something deeper from the theoretical point of view why the same form is working basically for all these points. So we also tried, of course, alter alternate parameterization and they lead to similar results. And this gives to a case squared, which is better than one for most of the fits. So this is shown on this plot. I mean, there are the fits. And what is shown in addition are the star which correspond to the extrapolation of those fits to 1.96 TeV, which is the Tevatron center of mass energy. So now we are quite happy. Basically, we have some prediction of the characteristic point at 1.96 TeV. So what we need to do in the last point is to predict what will be, let me go back one second, a few slides, what will be from the D0 point of view, which is here, the values of the totem measurement at the same t values at the d0 measurement because we need to, pre to predict directly what is the difference between pp and pp bar data so in order to do this what we do is to fit the characteristic point that we just determined by a double exponential formula which is written here which is called h of t i must say that this function is chosen for fitting purposes only there is no really theoretical motivation to this. There are only two parts because in fact, the two exponential terms cross around the dip. One is rapidly falling as a function of T and becomes negligible in the IT range, whereas the other terms rise off the dip. And what I should mention, we also perform the fit only in the common range of the measurements between totem and D0, because we can only compare data where we have a common domain in T, where we have both data set, again, at different square root of S. Concerning the systematic uncertainties, we take basically the correlation matrix, the full correlation matrix into to account. And I should just mention that search formula, in fact, leads also to a good description of all totem data in the dim bump region, which is the common domain in T, where there are totem and D0 So now, what is the last step? Because I put maybe something a bit uh, under the carpet. I mean, we, we, we are able now to, to predict some uh, values of the, the sigma dt at the same point as the D0 measurement. But there is still the issue of the relative normalization between the D0 measurement and the extrapolated totem. Uh, Christophe, you have uh, three minutes left. OK, thank you. So the issue of this relative normalization is basically, for instance, there is some uncertainties related to luminosity. So this we have to take into account. So the way we do this, 
we, we will take this into account by adjusting the total and D0 data sets to have the same cross sections at the optical point, which is D sigma DT equal zero. So for this, we need first to predict the total cross section from total. So the black points correspond to the total measurement and we predict it at 1.96 TV using this formula, which is here, that lead to the value of about 1.3 millibar. So from there, we can compute what is the value of the sigma dt because there is this optical theorem, which is the formula, which is written here. And this leads to a total the sigma dt value at t equal zero at the optical point of about 357 millibar per GeV squared. D0 also measured this quantity at small t to be 341. So we rescale the total data by the ratio of this uh, d sigma dt as equal to zero so that we can get a fair comparison between both data sets. Of course, we do not claim that we perform the measurement of d sigma dt at the optical point because this would require additional measurement close to t equals zero, but this is a relative, an arbitrary relative normalization between the two data sets. Okay, so basically, so this is a kind of a, a money plot. So that we have here, the D0 points that are the, the, blue, the blue, blue point compared to the extrapolation by totem, which is the red point. So the last step is now to compare the chi-squared to examine the probability for D0 and totem to agree, or in this case, to disagree. And what we obtain using a chi-squared method is a p-value of about six ten to minus four, or a significance of 3.4 sigma. So the last step that we want to do now is to combine it with a previous measurement by totem, which is the value of rho and the sigma tot measurement. Rho is the ratio of the real to imaginary part of the nuclear elastic amplitude at t equal to zero. And what is shown on this plot is basically the value of the total cross section. So this is in blue, and there are the, the measurement of totem in red. The blue line corresponds to a log plus log square fit, and the green line purely a log fit, log s fit. And on the right, you have the raw measurement, where you see that the green curve is basically favored for the raw measurement, whereas the blue curve is favored for the total cross section measurement. So this is using the data at 13 TV at very low T in the Coulomb nuclear interference region. So these data are completely independent from the data that I mentioned before for the D0 and totem comparison. That's why we can basically combine these two measurements in order to obtain our final significance. So when we combine these data, so the, for the model preferred by Compete, the total row measurement at 13 TV provided a 4.6 sigma significance, so this row measurement that I told you. And if we combine it with the D0 and total study, we obtain a total significance from a 5.7 sigma. And of course, it's model dependent we thought of this combination we bro. So we obtained a combined significance between 5.2 and 5.7 sigma. So now let me come to the conclusion because the time is probably uh, over. So for the, the first time, so we studied the comparison between PP bar and PP elastic data. The first comparison was to measure the ratio of the bump over dip, which shows already a difference with more than three sigma. Then we fitted eight characteristic points of elastic PP data so that we can make predictions on uh, elastic PP data at 1.96 TeV. When we compare the both cross section, they differ with a significance of 3.4 sigma in a model independent way. And that already provides evidence that the colorless C odd gluonic compound or the odeiron is needed to explain elastic scattering at high energy. When we combine this with the raw and total cross-section result at 13 TV from totem, then we obtain a significance in between 5.2 to 5.7 sigma. And that constitutes the first experimental observation of the other one, which is basically a bicycle discovery combining both accelerators, CERN and Tevatron. So thank you, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, that's beautiful results and uh, very, very good, nice talk. Uh, thank you. Thank uh, you. Now we have, uh, we have time uh, for questions. Uh, the first question is from Wodek Gulen. Uh, Wodek, please go ahead. Thank you, Christoph. Uh, so thank you. As you know, I've heard your talk before. 
Yes. <laughs> and, I, uh, and I have a couple of uh, comments in addition to the ones I made before, but maybe with uh, people who are here, let me go through some of them. Mm -hmm. uh, on slide five that I never discussed with you, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I thought I understood. On slide five, you're showing the sigma dt for, for elastic scattering that includes the result from totem at 1.96 uh, uh, TV. And yet uh, uh, somehow uh, you, you, you're not yes. using those points. Extrapolation, or... it's extrapolated to one. Yeah. Uh, no, these are extrapolated, the black mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. points. Yes. Yes, the black points, uh, sorry, I mean, I should have mentioned it, but the, the measurements are the at uh, 13, 8, 7, and 2.76 TV. And the result of 1.96 is the extrapolated result. Basically, you oh, see okay. the, the, the eight points that we mentioned in the, the following. Thank yeah, you, yeah. Thank the, you. There is no measurement. In right, fact, fine, fine. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I, I was, in fact, uh, maybe the, I, I want to stress that, I mean, it would be ideal, of course, to be able to measure at the same energy. But we would not have any acceptance, even if we are able to run the, the LHC at this energy. I mean, we would have no acceptance in the, in the dip and the bump, unfortunately. So this measurement is not possible at the LHC, unfortunately. OK, so I, I'm sorry, because I know there was an attempt to make this. But that's not the major point. Thank you for clarifying. Uh, I, I Look, first of all, I agree that uh, you know we all do, as experimentalists, the best we can. Right, mm -hmm. so that's what you've done, and it's uh, it's uh, I, I just I just have a little bit of an issue with the language that you are using to describe the results. So, so this is uh, I'm not questioning uh, w w what you did and how you did it, but uh, you have your own, uh, as I mentioned before, your own model, which is not like regex based or any theory based, but it's still you're using some parameterization, which is uh, which is a a, a, a sort of quick model to go from uh, the measured values to uh, to the va to to the root s that you need. So I think it's uh, I have a, I've always had an issue with you calling it that it, it's a model independent uh, method. You know, as you mentioned uh, just a minute ago, that the real model independent method is to compare data at the same root s. Mm, uh, yes. The next is. thing is. Uh, uh, so, you know, I just want to make that point again, because I, I really think it's uh, a little bit stretched, but I do understand what you've done. And that's not talking about what you've done, but how you describe the result. Yeah, um, maybe I, I can just uh, go ahead. mention a short comment. Uh, sorry, uh, <laughs> no, what I wanted to, to say, I have no time to, to describe everything, of course. So this is the, the only thing that we have, we fit basically four points, so we can get only two parameters. So this is one of the easiest parameterization that you could think of. We also tried other kind of parameterization that leads basically to very similar results for the extrapolation. But we, we don't want to go beyond two parameters because again, we have only four square root of s, so four points. Right. So we cannot, I mean, use more parameters than this for the, for the fits. So we don't have that many choice. We, we choose other uh, uh, parameterization actually. The, uh, I mean, we, I had no time to, di to discuss this, sure. but they, they lead to very something very similar. So that's why we are talking. I agree that there is this kind of model between code because there are these formula, but by using different formula, we get quite a similar result. I mean, this is what right. I want to, that, to stress. That would be nice to, right. Uh, so it would be nice to mention that that would give you a little bit of uh, idea about the systematic uncertainty about the extrapolation. Yes, But yes. Uh, uh, the, uh, the other two points are also the language and uh, I know what you've done. So uh, I, what do you mean by, by the compound? Because I never heard about the pomeron, which is two gluons, to be called the compound of, of two gluons. And uh, yeah. a three gluon or two gluon exchange is, it doesn't have to be a compound. It, it is just exchange. It's a diagram where uh, whatever is exchanged is exchanged. So what do you mean by, by calling this a compound and how do you identify it as a compound? So what what is a compound? Well, actually? I mean, it's maybe more a question. 
Yeah. It would be more maybe a, a question for a theorist, but the way you interpreted this uh, ladder of two gluons, so two gluons, four gluons, six gluons, blah, blah, blah. In the, so this would be a compound of two gluons, whereas this odeuron would be a compound of three, five, seven, nine gluons, is the way that I interpret it. So, so maybe, I don't know, some theorists would like to, to comment about it. It may be more a, a question to theorists to know if it's- But, the, but, yeah. but you know that in the most naive uh, uh, approach, which is actually was the first, you know, Know, still, you know, at the ISR time, uh, Giorgio Mathieu showed it a lot that where you have three quarks and a three gluon exchange, uh, each gluon was exchanged with one, one quark from each of the protons. So that was certainly not a compound. So I don't understand mm -hmm. what you mean by a compound. You call it yeah, a particle well, well, or you, what do you call it? Because it's you're going something between the exchange and the particle. Definitely then. not a particle. Because it, yeah, yeah. Because it, definitely not a particle. Because pomeron and odeuron are not a particle that can be observed, uh, like an electron or whatever. So right, this, right. what we mean by this is really something which is made of, let's say, either an odd or even number of gluons. So maybe compound is not the best word. I mean, I, I don't know. Again, they. Uh, would be good to have some comments from theorists about it. I mean, uh, I don't know. Yeah, I think yeah. a, a three gluon exchange is the, the best, the, the best yeah. one for me. But three or uh, odd, let's say the three, because it could be five, it could be seven, it could be, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's why we wanted then, to compound because we, we don't restrict to three or, and also in a way there is a ladder. So there are all these horizontal gluons. Yeah, but, but so three is uh, also a bit wrong or two gluons is a bit, a bit biased uh, well, in a way. Yeah. Well, we're talking all, always at the lowest order, right? Because yeah, once yes, you have, uh, yes. Mm -hmm. so I, I hope you, you can. And the last thing, I'm sorry, uh, uh, no. your 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 this I never commented on, but uh, the, I your, your uh, you have a quote unquote experimental result from the data, which is what you obtained. And you combine it with the theoretical, uh, with the difference uh, with respect to some uh, one of the models or whatever it is that your 4.7 sigma. Uh, that strikes me a little bit unusual because usually people, uh, when they combine uh, to get a uh, statistical significance, I point you to, for example, most recent G minus two result to obtain the significance that it was, you know quite significant, as you know. Uh, they combine two experimental results and uh, not a, an experimental result with certain, uh, with the deviation from a theory, because in terms of a theory, one can find a theory that uh, the experimental result doesn't differ from that much and will affect your, your, your final five, five point something sigma. So. I just want to comment that this is not a very common uh, way yes. to combine, uh, to get a significance of the result. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. so let me try maybe to comment a bit. So there is this 3.4 sigma, as you said, I mean, as I mentioned, it's direct comparison between D0 and the totem. So this is this part. And what you discuss is basically the, com the combination with this previous observation by totem with the difference between rho and the sigma tot. And the issue, I mean, this difference can be observed. I mean, there is these lines that are coming, for instance, from a compete. And the problem is that the difference exists independently of compete. But the problem to quantify what is the number of sigma, let's say, between these two curves, between these two elements, this is theory dependent. That's why, for instance, the, the Durham model will give you another value of the difference than the compete model. That's why we quote, in fact, a range of the sigma difference rather than the, the pure value of the, the difference. Because for instance, I mean, this is from all the models that exist nowadays in the, on the market, basically. So the, this is the different uh, model, as I said, for instance, this compete model that is illustrated on this plot. We did also with the people, the, the Durham model. So this is, that's why since they predict different, they have different assumptions that predict different values of rows, so different blue and green curves, if you want. So the number of sigma will be different. This is the, the issue. That's why we get this range 5.2 to 5.7 sigma. But for all the models that exist on the market, 
everything is always above five sigma. So I agree, this is a bit model dependent, but the big thing is that it's always above five. There is no existing model on the market which will give less than five. Well, yeah, uh, this, this, this. there is there is a model by Marty Block from uh, 2010 or slightly earlier, where at least when I checked, I, I didn't go too carefully to look. Uh, I, I understand you're quoting right now the, the most uh, common models. Uh, yes. Uh, where, uh, which, you know, I am in the same business, so I know all of them, of course. Yeah, uh, of course I know. <laughs> so so, so uh, those models, there's a Marty Block model, which I would encourage you to look at and uh, whether, where this difference would be smaller. So that, that's all I want to say. Yeah. But, uh, and the problem of the block model is that it doesn't describe at all, I think the data at 13 TV. I think they, because they are predicting some resonance at higher T and so on. But this we can discuss, I mean, uh, offline, of course, I mean, to, together. Right. <laughs> okay. Yes. Uh, okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, we have to continue with program. Uh, we have another question from Leszek Moptyka. Leszek, please uh, go ahead. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, Christoph, it's wonderful analysis. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank uh, you. So you, you, since tradition were called to comment on this compound state, and maybe very briefly to Wodek. Um, so, so I think all, all the other one uh, is really based on three gluons. So this is the lowest order, but then you have exchanges between these gluons, so they interact. So the, this is more like ledger, ledger type um, kind of terminology then we think about some compound state by MDT channels. It's not real particle, but rather interacting figure on state. Uh, and uh, I think it's non-perturbative non uh, altogether because it's a pretty low momenta involved. So, uh, so, so there is a lot, there's a lot of interaction going on. And so this is the comment. Now the question, so can you, uh, Christoph, tell something about the uh, energy dependence of the of their own exchange amplitude. So can you say it's rising with square root of S or decreasing? Uh, so from your feeds, can you get any information about it? Probably not, right? Uh, not yet. I mean, the, the word, I mean, for now, I mean, just the, the only thing we, we got is basically this uh, extrapolation. So it's a bit difficult and the, we don't know if, I mean, this is again, since it's a bit of model independence, it's difficult to go outside these two to uh, 13 TV. Right? There were some uh, ISR measurements, as you know, I mean, that were uh, some yeah. kind of indication that there might be uh, some other one in the past. But then if, if we are at lower square root of S, we are also in the resonance region, which is more tricky. So I'm not saying that it's uh, not a study that could be done, and this should be done, I think. It try to extrapolate what we did to ISR energy and compare with the data. But it's not sure that this formula will be still valid because the big problem that, that we have, I mean, it was illustrated a bit at the, the beginning. Let me try to find it. Where is it? It's especially in, yes, in this R value is that we have a range, a full range where between 100 GV to 1 TV where we have basically not that many measurements. So this is to extrapolate, but I, mean, I agree it can be done as an exercise. I mean, uh, if it will be valid or not is another question, but it can be done as an exercise and it will be interesting. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, the last question is from uh, Kent Osterberg, please. Uh, you are muted. Yeah, maybe I can actually add some information. I mean, to, okay. towards Lesek's question, Lesek's question about the, can we actually get some energy dependence? Not yet based on this data, but however, we have nine, we have data at 900 GeV, so which where we can also measure the total cross section mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. and the row, and then we hope to see at least be able to compare between 13 TV and and, and 900 GeV. Yes, it's true. It's true. Yeah. I have recently taken data that are being uh, analyzed. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then maybe, maybe, maybe to Vladek also on 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 this what this this uh, when we use actually rho and, and sigma dot to to actually ex to extract the other. In fact, if if the 
PP and PP bar would be the same if they were the same behavior, you would you would be able to to with with models to describe it and 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 actually the fact that we, we are not able one is not able to describe with a model both the rho and the sigma dot actually indicates the difference of also of, of between PP and PP bar. So it's actually basically the same which we are are measuring here, but at, at a completely different t values yes as i said that, that's why we could combine them i mean the com combine the two uh, measurements yeah. all right i understand what you're saying i just can i just say this that i'm not 100 percent in agreement with you on that step leave it there because uh, it, it's still comparison with some i understand there is discrepancy that's true but you have an experimental result and you have comparison with some kind of theory prediction. And you're combining the two to get the five sigma, uh, uh, to get the five sigma significance, right? So that, yeah. that is the mm -hmm. point. Because mm -hmm. you find that, what do you do? You find a theory that you are six sigma away, then you don't need a measurement. That's what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. At least, I mean, it's clear the, that the data are definitely incompatible. Like I was saying here, yeah. if you compare the red points here and the red points here, this is the point. Then the, the argument of the deck is more what is the, the way to quantify this difference. Yeah. Yeah. And the only right. way we have, unfortunately, is via this to study what is the difference between all the models that we know on the market. This is maybe the, because we don't have a pure, simple way to compare directly the data points, unfortunately. This is the, yeah. as and you know. I don't want to, <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah we agree. I, actually, you understand my point. I understand your yeah, point. Yeah, sure. Sure. Yeah. 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 All I want to say is I, our chairman is probably uh, ready to close the session. I don't want to get in trouble with the chairman. That's never a good thing to do. So we, if, if there was a real, if there were a real coffee break, we would have a coffee with the chairman included. Yes. Or chair lady, sorry. Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I, I think uh, we can finish the session now. And uh, now we have uh, time for coffee break. Uh, so we have only 12 minutes. <coughs> sorry. You, you can blame me for all this. Okay. okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank bye you very bye much. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Of this session for very nice, very interesting talks, uh, and all of you for your uh, participating uh, questions, comments. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>